dark and grey An English film, the Wednesday play We always watch the Queen on Christmas Day Won't you stay? It's July 1976 and Genesis have just played the last show of their Trick of the Tail tour, the success of which left the band not only in a better financial position but also with a renewed confidence that they could not only survive Peter Gabriel's departure but develop and improve from it. Similarly buoyed with the success of his first solo album, Steve Hackett at this time asked his bandmates if he could take time off to do a second solo album before commencing work on the next Genesis one. Maybe being conscious of the musical changes in the air and wanting to capitalise on their growing popularity, the rest of the band decided otherwise and during a summer heatwave of that year wrote what ultimately became their most mature and autumnal music. The seeds of Hackett's discontent were further sown when he requested that tracks put on this new album should be more equally divided, with each band member receiving a quarter of the writing credits. This was another idea vetoed by the band. So in September 1976, what was mainly for tax avoidance reasons, the band relocated to Relight Studios in Hilvarenbeck in Holland. Despite this move, the resulting album turned out to have more of an English feel to it than even 1973's Selling England. Holland is a quiet and clean and laid back sort of country, and it's perhaps this calm and distance that made Genesis more focused on the psyche of their homeland. In a similar way that the Beach Boys Holland album also evoked their strongest connections with their homeland and the general Californian mythology. Mike Rutherford has made reference to life in Holland having no interference at all from the outside world from dawn till dusk. To further underscore the anglicised nature of Wonder Wuthering, one needs to consider how much the weather plays an important part in life on our blustery island. Like Eskimos and the word snow, there's over a hundred English words and expressions to describe the rain, with Englishmen being more likely to comment on the weather when meeting someone than asking that person how they're feeling. And further to this, each of the Wind and Wuthering vocal tracks features some sort of reference to the weather or sheltering from it. This all results in a more reflective and weighty tone to Wind and Wuthering than perhaps any other Genesis album. Now while it isn't a concept album in the true sense of the word, there does seem to be a thread that knits all these tracks together, and it's certainly the last truly organic sounding Genesis album. Perhaps some of these common strands across the album stem from another of its influences, namely the Emily Bronte novel Wuthering Heights.
The names Wind and Wuthering were working titles for the songs that ended up being called Unquiet Slumbers for the Sleepers and In That Quiet Earth. Now these new titles were direct quotes from the closing lines of the Emily Bronte novel. And like the band's lyrics, storms and the turbulent English weather are also prominent features of this literary classic. Furthermore, looking at Afterglow's lyrics, you could easily read these as being a direct reference to the main Wuthering Heights characters of Heathcliff and Caffey. Without giving away too many spoilers, Heathcliff ends up searching everywhere just to hear Cathy's call, the meaning of all that he believed before escaping him as he misses Cathy more. The lyrics of Afterglow match the book's narrative perfectly. Heathcliff also says to Cathy about giving to you my soul. I don't think any of these links to the weather and Wuthering Heights are a coincidence. And it could have just been the nervous pre-punk atmosphere that prevented making Wind of Wuthering a full-blown concept album recreation of this Bronte novel. So if you think of Trick of the Tail as the sound of a band full of excitement and curiosity and an eagerness to please, Wind of Wuthering was the sound of a band while pleasing themselves. There's a sense of calm and confidence about this album. The sound of a band that doesn't have to try so hard this time. A band that can let moods meander and take them where they will. Whereas Trick of the Tail has a breadth of style, it's when the withering that goes deeper, deeper into a more romantic and at times melancholy beauty. Now, while Rutherford is somewhat reserved about the final album, both Steve Hackett and Tony Banks do consider it to be the band's finest. I feel that's a sentiment that many watching this will agree with. To complement the sometimes cold and autumnal tone of the music, the album cover features a sparse watercolour painting of a solitary oak tree standing alone in a bleak morning field. For its original release, this image was printed onto a textured watercolour paper, a kind of parchment, and it was a lovely effect that's been lost on future repressings, and certainly this screen. The artist Colin Elgi, working again under the guidance of hypnosis, is quite dismissive of the colour and feels it should have had more colour to it. The idea for the image came to him recalling a scene in the 1965 film The Warlord in which Charlton Heston stands by a tree with birds flying from it. It's bizarre to think folks but what you're looking at now was the original idea for the Wind and Wuthering cover. The final album was released on the 17th of December 1976 with a chart success similar to that of Trick of the Tail. In the US, however, it sold substantially more, probably as a result of the volume of touring there, and also Your Own Special Way being a minor hit single. The band's American connections were further developed with the introduction of drummer Chester Thompson. He featured not only on tour, but also in much of the band's promotional material and photography from here on in. Let's now take a step inside the sometimes dark and grey world beneath this cover and explore the songs that did and didn't make it onto this wonderful record. With music written by Banks and Hackett, it's Rutherford's picturesque lyrics that are perhaps the standout aspect of this track. It tells the rough story of a Scottish aristocrat during the Jacobite Wars of the 1700s. That was an Anglo-Scottish conflict for the crown of our kingdom. The acoustic part, Time to Go to Bed Now, was originally a completely different Steve Hackett song titled The House of the Four Winds, another wind connection. 
The Genesis were fond of taking lyrics directly from existing literature, and the opening line for this song can also be found in a book called The Flight of the Heron. This song had been started during the Trick of the Tail writing sessions, but Banks wanted to extend the piece into something more expansive and spent a year developing it. The results are spectacular, and it surely stakes a claim for what could be his greatest composition. The lyrics are based on a book called Phoenix in Obsidian by Michael Moorcock, in which a time traveller finds himself being a chosen one an inadvertent spiritual leader in a parallel universe. It also has themes of self-doubt and delusions of grandeur. The song was perhaps best realised when played live, especially on the 1980 Duke tour. And yet another reference to existing literature that evokes autumn. This song quotes lines from a Victorian poem called Who Has Seen the Wind? and contains a guitar tuning that Rutherford claims he's never been able to quite recreate exactly since. Some may say it's not a bad thing. It was released as a single charting at a modest 43 in the UK and 63 in the US and perhaps pointed the direction that the band would be heading to more in the future with more relationship and romantic lyrics. The song was about Rutherford's wife. Personally, I think the song outstays its welcome slightly. The middle section is quite aimless and the ending just seems to repeat the first part. Banks himself wished that the song had been edited down also. And considering the length of the final album and the sheer volume of tracks left off it, it's hard to understand why the song was dragged out for over six minutes. The version playing now is from the group's 1986 tour in Australia, where the song was wonderfully accompanied by a small orchestra. It's well worth checking out. He's a blinding light. Oh, 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 oh. Now won't you call me, whoever you are, you follow me quite. This is a Collins inspired jazz fusion number that was originally a section for both One for the Vine and Hackett's Please Don't Touch. It's a divisive song that has been openly dismissed by the guitarist. It's a sentiment that I don't think has been overlooked by Tony Banks who on overseeing the 2007 remixes completely took out much of Steve Hackett's guitar on this song. The track What Gorilla enjoyed a solitary live outing on the first night of the Wind and Wuthering tour as a kind of botched medley with Lily White Lilith and The Waiting Room.
think I might go out for a stroll Into the night and out of this hole Maybe find me a meal Next up is a comedic song by Tony Banks, reminiscent to the style of Robbery, Assault and Battery. Banks has later disowned these lyrics as being too literal, and Collins often cites this as one of the many Genesis tracks where the lyrics work better on paper than perhaps being sung. Suddenly he bumps into fall, it's very unwise. A cat is much quicker than men and their eyes. The chase that ensues can have only one end, unless outside help steps in for our friend in me. The song started life as a much grander epic in the style of One for the Vine before the band made a complete U-turn and made it much simpler. It was played live on early show dates and showcases a triumphant closing solo by Steve Hackett that seems to herald him taking ownership of side two of the album. This is a song of astonishing sophistication from Steve Hackett, with a chorus and some lyrics written by Phil Collins. It evokes a similar mood to the English cultural decline that was lamented in Dancing with the Moonlit Night. It's a highly vivid track, and is told as a sort of mini kitchen sink drama, set in a cosy night in staring at the telly. It's slightly reminiscent of the earlier Hackett and Collins collaboration for Absent Friends. The song features a whole host of TV references and general life in the mid 70s, yet it doesn't seem to have dated at all, and if anything has grown richer and more poignant and powerful with age. I feel it's without doubt the standout moments of this album, and this single song, more than any other, seems to sum up the real emotional core of this band yet to most passing fans it's probably barely known it was never performed live but was at one time considered to be played as part of the 2008 reunion tour before being replaced by ripples the visuals here come from an astonishing rendition of this track by musician sally sparks you can find it on youtube and it's an absolute delight Beginning with dreamlike classical guitar playing by Hackett, this track is reminiscent of some of the textures on the lamp like Silent Sorrow or Ravine. It perfectly conjures up the images of the wild and windy English moors that its namesake, Wuthering Heights, is set in. It's a wonderful kind of cinematic track and a great curtain raiser for the climax that follows. In a similar manner to the 11th Earl of Mar, which bookends this song, the track showcases the band playing in a really unified way. The band's enjoyment in playing it is obvious, and the track was reprised as part of song medleys for many years. Banks claims that this simple number was written in almost as much time as it took to play it. It's a cyclic, kind of progressing song that ends the album wonderfully. He did have initial reservations about the song when it suddenly occurred to him that he may have inadvertently written the Christmas classic, Have Yourself a Very Merry Christmas Again. There is an uncanny similarity between the two. Dig 
give me shelter Are all as one to me now There are several tracks that were either recorded or rehearsed in Holland that never made it onto the final album. Let's look at some of these tracks and see perhaps how Wind and Withering could have been made into a double album. In May 1977, whilst on tour, the band released three of these tracks as the Spot the Pigeon EP. The first of these is Match of the Day. It's one of the strangest tracks that the band ever recorded and it's an ode to the Saturday night TV show that shows highlights of football matches. The lyrics, which are now disowned by Arthur Collins, are full of references to the English national sport. It's been long thought that a video was made of this song with Collins singing on the terraces of the QPR football ground that he's meant to be a supporter of. However, this video has failed to see the light of day and there's no photographs that even exist of it, so it's, it's hard to know if this really ever did exist. Good game, mate, Ron. Did you see that goal in the second half? Cool. Bit of a dirty tackle, that, mate. I reckon it should have been a penalty myself. We paid £400,000 for him, do you realise that? Oh, look out, here comes a bottle. The next track on the EP is Pigeons. Although this jaunty track is credited to Banks, Collins and Rutherford only, it shows a similarity with Hackett's banjo-esque ballad of a decomposing man. I think the lyrics are fantastic and it has a hypnotic groove that works brilliantly. It's a, a much underrated track. I'm going to go out on a limb here and include this one on my imagined double wind and wuthering album. The final track on Spot the Pigeon was Inside and Out. Although this is often thought to be exclusively a Hackett number, the lyrics were actually by Mike Rutherford. It's an outstanding song, and one that perfectly captures both the acoustic and the dynamic contrasts found in the main album perfectly. It's like the whole album rolled into one song. It was introduced into the live set list in the latter part of the tour, and it's hard to understand why this song was omitted from the final album. Therefore, it has to be included here. The Hackett tracks Hoping Love Will Last and Please Don't Touch were also offered to the band during the recording sessions. Both ended up being on Steve's subsequent solo album, but I think they would have worked brilliantly with Genesis. Hoping Love Will Last is a soulful love song, and one that would have suited Collins' voice perfectly. If it had been used, you could imagine the slightly awkward classical section in the song being replaced by Banks and thus earning him an extra co-writing credit. The track Please Don't Touch is more or less a retelling of In That Quiet Earth. It has a similar ambient opening called The Land of a Thousand Autumns, and it showcases Hackett's fondness for dynamic twists and turns. I, this would have been surely sensational to watch Genesis perform this track live. Another solo Hackett number that had its origins in the Lamb writing sessions was Kim, and this is also included on our imagined double album. A resequencing gives us a double wind and wuthering album, with the tracks having a slightly more elongated style in parts in the manner of the Lamb to give it more breathing space. 
Steve Hackett has referenced another potential win track as ending up on Spectral Mornings. I don't know what this is though. And it was also known that the solo track Narnia was also written in the Genesis days. So it's difficult to tell just how many potential tracks he presented to the band at this point. One can easily sense Hackett's frustration during these latter years with the band as he started to equal banks in terms of songwriting quality and quantity. However, in an equal way, it must have been frustrating for the rest of the band to see Steve stockpile so much material while they were struggling to complete the lamp and even trick of the tail to a degree. The loss of Steve Hackett had a huge effect on this band, and the next album, and then there were three, suffered somewhat from his absence. In a way, the trick of the tale didn't when Gabriel left. Although Hackett's solo career was more modest commercially than his ex-bandmates, he's definitely richer artistically, with a solo career more varied and yet true to its roots than Genesis and Gabriel's. He also seems to have a real heartfelt connection to the music and the fans that the others just seem to have lost. If Banks was the brains of this band, and Collins and Gabriel its outward charm and personality, and Rutherford its drive and energy, I feel Steve Hackett is without doubt the band's soul. So there you have it, the concept album that perhaps never was. The story of wind and wuthering. <laughs>